There's a reason why the better zoos and public aquariums refer to the displays as habitats. The first goal is always what the animals need, and after, how do we make it look awesome as well? I've been aquascaping wrong for decades. It's not about looking cool, stability, not about coral placement, not even about flow. It's a fish tank. It's where they live. What happens when we give the fish what they want? Will they give us what we want? Today on BRS TV Investigates, we add habitat into the NSA mix. Can we produce an aquascape that reduces aggression, stress, mortalities, and even allows us to comfortably house more fish in the same size tank while keeping everyone happy? I believe we've done it with the HNSA, and it might just change the way the hobby considers aquascaping reef tanks. This story starts with the negative space aquascaper NSA, top shelf aquatics built for me out of Haitian rock. It's stunning, open, the pieces intertwine with each other. There's a seamless, nearly impossible look, an awesome potential for flow characteristics. However, Haitian rock doesn't exist anymore, so what are other reefers supposed to do? This is the birth of the Marco Rock NSA. Many of you likely saw me smash Marco Rock up and reassemble it into a smaller aquascape that maintained many of the most interesting aspects of the top shelf scape. The larger 120 version and how to video followed right after, and I didn't think that the open space design could be beat from a visual flow or coral mounting perspective, and I'd never build a scape any other way, and I was wrong. Ultimately, what I missed is the open negative space provides very little habitat for the fish. The big smooth structure just doesn't have a lot of nooks or natural shelter for hiding or resting. I saw it in my own tank. Even though it's 360 gallons and relatively few fish for a tank that size, there's a lot of nip fins, a decent amount of aggression, stress, and even some mysterious losses of fish. Elliot at Marine Collector suggested that I consider building mini habitats of open structure rock and adding them to the tank. When I did that, the fish immediately moved in and the problems dissipated. This is one of those missed pieces. When pointed out, it's instantly clear. This is where the fish live, and like any community, they fight over the best homes or habitat, as well as benefit from safe retreats when other members are jerks. For instance, in the Clown Harem series, where we maintained 30 clownfish for four years in a 120, success largely based on managing aggression through a stable supply of food and ample habitat, homes, and retreats. I've also seen it in my own tank when I add those mini habitats to supplement the negative space scape. So that sets us up for today's challenge, incorporate habitat into a negative space design. Let's start with what matters most, a responsibility to care for fish's needs and habitat, but not let go of what makes a tank look awesome, provides wide open flow in, through, and behind the rock, and ample location for corals. Lastly, I'd also like it to be easy to remove and transfer to another tank without skipping a beat if needed allowing us to otherwise capture impossible fish down the road. Can this all be done? Well, you be the judge. This is the HNSA we put together. We have over 25 different retreats and resting areas throughout the entire scape. Mission accomplished on that front. I'm confident this habitat considered and accounted for the fish's needs. You won't just see them swimming back and forth, but rather in and out and throughout the entire tank and habitat. But does it look good and does it still meet the standard of negative space? There's no question, filling in areas, creating coves, overhangs, and hideouts also fills in some of the negative space. However, you can see ample open space, particularly when you look at the tank from a variety of angles. I'd call it a hybrid. Once the habitat is incorporated, it always a little bit less negative space, but you can find the unique balance that you're looking for. However, it's those impossible overhangs, open areas, coves, and balance of space that retains that same awesome look of an aquascape built for our eyes and a display in our homes. It's the same characteristics that provide for awesome flow in front, behind, and throughout the scape, all done without sacrificing space for coral. In fact, I think there's likely more coral locations than many aquascape styles. We also did it with two pieces which appear to be intertwined. The two pieces are heavy but manageable. We can take the scape out and put it back in the tank with near zero effort. Okay, so how do you do this for yourself? The core of this is just breaking Reef Saver or Marco Rock into pieces and reassembling them into new unique shapes in one larger cohesive structure. But the results are in the technique and we learned some new techniques to share. First, right tools for the job. This is what we used on this scape for a 120 gallon tank. One large container of extra thick glue, one large container of general bonding glue, five insets, 22 sticks of gray epoxy, a few syringes, acetone, stir sticks, canned air, a large metal mallet, chisel with guard, 200 pounds of reef saver rock, a half dozen small pieces of foundation rock, one large and one medium foundation, a bag of oolite sand is optional but I'll show you a new technique we used to avoid the need for sand. 
Building the scape is pretty easy. The flat bottom foundation pieces, maybe the most critical pieces of building an open scape like this, they're going to provide leverage. And you'll see why we don't actually stack rocks on many of them. We often build pillars out of it and create open space. To build the rest of the structure, you'll need to use the hammer and chisel to break up larger rocks. They break pretty easy, but if you take a minute on each piece to look for the fault lines to leverage, you'll create more unique shapes. The most useful pieces tend to be the thin shelves, pillar shaped, and generally just irregular shaped pieces. You might be surprised to find that the medium to smaller pieces are the most useful. And don't be afraid of taking a bunch of small golf ball sized pieces and using them to create something totally new. When breaking it up, do it on some cardboard to save the dust. We'll use it later. To glue the pieces together, we're going to use extra thick gel in the Instaset Accelerator. The goal here is a nice thin layer between and over the joints. Use the stir sticks to get it where you need it. Try to make it look decent, but we're going to cover it later, so don't get too hung up on how it looks. Once we spray on the accelerator, in 10 seconds we'll hold a pretty surprising amount of weight and you can work on the next piece. If you need it to be even stronger, add another thin layer or two and spray Instaset in between. Try and avoid big globs of glue because they can take hours or even days to dry. Even with the Instaset, the thick globs will dry on the outside, but the center stays gooey for a long time. The nice thing about the gel and accelerator method is it's easy to get the adhesive where it needs to go, even on vertical surfaces, nooks, or even on the undersides of surfaces. While you're building, keep the goals in mind, both that negative space or attractive look as well as the habitat. With negative space, it's easy for the build to get away from you. Add in a few pieces, we lose that effect. So often the best looks are achieved by not what you add, but what you take off. It's a process. Never feel committed to anything and welcome opportunities to take something off and take a totally new direction. It's also not a race, it's a hobby, and the best changes we made came from stepping away from the project for a day or a few hours and taking a look with fresh eyes. The most natural and interesting looks also will not share parallel lines or right angles, so don't put the shelf at the same angles and don't make the shelves entirely flat. Give them a contour that follows other natural lines. The pillars and supports should rarely be straight up and down. Find an angle. It's also the details that count. When you find a straight edge, give it that piece that gives it a little bit of visual interest or flair. It takes more effort to do, but whenever possible, try not to connect the structures or overhangs. You can see a dozen areas where we chose not to connect one rock to an outcropping and give it that impossible look. From a habitat perspective, look for anywhere you can to not just have swim throughs, but substantial overhangs or nooks. Be aware you can go too far with this and transition the negative space into more of a wall look. So don't be afraid to take some off and find that balance. However, many people may find they actually like this unique version of the wall look with 50 times the habitat and a much more personal, unique scape than many other approaches. Once the scape is together, it's time to reinforce the structure. In the past, we did this with mortar or cement, which works well and cheap. However, it's hard to get into a lot of locations like vertical surfaces or under joints. It's also messy to mix and apply. This time we used gray epoxy, partially because Randy's Investigates found epoxy to be stronger bond on dry surfaces. However, the real win with epoxy is the thick consistency. It allows you to apply it to nearly any surface. You can wrap it around surfaces and it holds within minutes. I found rolling it out into tubes allows you to insert it into holes, follow glue line joints and wrap around objects and it made it a lot easier. My biggest complaint about epoxy in the past is the smooth surface from our thumbs is easy to spot and looks unnatural. This time I found pushing a small piece of rubble into it not only pushes the epoxy deeper into the structure, but it also gives it that natural texture that's easier to cover later. The structure now looks nice and stable, but it's also covered in glue lines and epoxy. You could put it into the tank this way in a year or so from now. Most of the surfaces that get light will be covered in coralline or coral, but we can also make it look flawless today with just the tiniest bit of effort. All we need to do is suck up some of the general bonding water-like glue into a syringe and apply it to the glue or epoxy on the rock and then throw some of the dusty bits we collected during the smashing process Five seconds later, blow it off with your can of air and it's almost gone. One more application and the joint is totally hidden. I like to do this on 10 joints at a time, blow them off and reapply. One of the cool pieces about this approach is the syringe can get into a lot of places and the thin water-like glue wicks onto surfaces and doesn't run off. It's wise to periodically clean the syringe with acetone. A typical syringe works well. I'd get a few because it will clog, 
but if you have an extra metal tip version like those found on FAPTASIA, these work awesome. Last time with the NSA, we used sand to cover the joints. However, the dusty finds from smashing up the rock match the color better. The small dusty particles harder to see and basically free. A win on all fronts. You may need to use the mallet to crush it up more and sift through the strainer to get the larger bits out. It's a bit of work, so some reefers will buy sand. If you do, buy dry oolite sand. That leaves us with the big question. What are we going to do with this new HNSA Aquascape? The last NSA ended up in the shadow testing tank for our Lighting Investigate series. This one, the Flow Investigate series, we want to see how powerheads work, the angle, the flow, the rate, the distance, and how it works in a tank with an aquascape. The Flow Dynamics playlist is right here.